Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Intro to Vetter webinar um, for administrators. Uh, my name is Barry. I'm a member of the customer success team at Vetter, and I am going to be hosting today's presentation. And I actually have a phone number for you guys. So I, I generally like to start these presentations off with um, giving the contact information in case you guys ever need to reach out to support. In case you guys have any questions, run into any type of issues, um, just know there's always a phone number that you can call and there's always an email that you can always send a message over to. And there's actually always a help desk that you can submit support tickets to as well. So I'm gonna show you that. Um, so first, let me give you the phone number for support. That number is 844-483-8837. And our email is support at vettersoftware.com. And if you're logged into Vetter, um, there is a resource I wanna point out to you guys. Um, if you click this little blue question mark icon, um, this is where you can go to access our help desk. And our help desk has a knowledge base, which has a bunch of different articles telling you how to do various things in Vetter. And then there's also a place to submit or view existing support tickets as well. Now, I also want to um, walk you through a couple other navigation shortcuts that may make your life easier from time to time. Um, the first thing I want to point out is this little green plus sign in the top right corner whenever you're logged into Better, You'll actually see all of these little navigation shortcuts um, no matter where you are in Better. So, so no matter where you navigate to, this will always be the, uh, an option for you to select. In this little green plus sign, this is our shortcut menu. And so this will allow for you to do any of these different things from whichever page you are on in Vetter. Um, so you can see that even though I'm in the reports module, I could still add a new patient in my system, or I could still record a new payment or even add a new item to my inventory. Um, so that's what the shortcut menu is useful for. Um, now, when you do start navigating through Vetter, if you click this little lightning bolt icon, um, this will show you the last 10 places that you just were. Um, within Vetter. Um, so it's a way to just quickly hop back to something that you were just working on or to give you an idea of, of the last 10 things that you were actually just working on as well. Uh, and then this little uh, lock icon, this is a, a way for you to quickly log in and log out of Vetter. Um, and the cool thing about locking um, your device, um, and this would be useful if maybe you guys have a terminal in the clinic that multiple staff members use throughout the day. Um, whenever you lock your device, it will actually lock you on the page that you were just working on. So when you unlock the device, it will actually unlock you to that same page. Um, so it's just a quick way to log in and lock out. And then finally, this little bell icon, this is where you can go to manually create new tasks in Vetter. Now, tasks in Vetter are simply to do. So something that you can assign to yourself or somebody else to be completed. And um, and if you click on this bell icon, this is where you can go to create a new task. And so you just kind of fill out this new window that pops up right here. Um, and then whenever a task is assigned to you, um, you can always, um, you will be notified. There'll be a little blue notification window that notifies the task has been assigned to you. Um, but you can always see uh, if a task is due for you, a little red flashing light on this bell icon. And if you click on it, you can click assign to me and that will take you over to your assigned me task list. Um, so all the tasks that are assigned to you that um, 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 you can go view and then you can complete. Um, so anyways, now um, I just want to give you kind of a little brief overview as to what these navigation shortcuts are in the top right corner. Um, so now we're actually going to start talking about um, um, a little bit more in detail about the settings module. So here I'm going to click on this little settings tab at the top of the screen. And you can see that it takes me over to the settings module. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and click on add-ons. So this is the first thing I want to talk about today. Um, so this add-ons tab contains a list of all of our integrations. Um, and so this is a, these are integrations with various partners we have or just add-ons to Vetter in general. Um, so if you guys are maybe using like, a, like um, a lab company, for example, to send out reference labs or to process in-house labs, you can actually kind of scroll down this list and see if that lab company um, 
appears as an option for you to enable. Um, so if you're using IDEX, for example, you guys have an IDEX vet lab station. We do have an IDEX integration, which allows for you to submit requests to the vet lab station directly from Vetter. And then whenever those results come back, they'll go back to that lab record that you created in Vetter. Um, so there's a bunch of different integrations that do a bunch of different things. And there is a description next to each one. Um, so you can just go through and you can just see if there, if any of these integrations seem like an option that can help your practice, um, just go through and read the description and, and, and see exactly what it does. And if it's something that you feel would be useful, um, you can always go over to the help desk and, and read one of our knowledge base articles that walks you through how to enable that integration, how to use that integration. Um, but it's actually super easy to enable any of these integrations. You just click this little green plus sign over on the right hand side. Like for example, we have our, our payment processing integration with Card Connect. And if you click the green plus sign, all you have to do is just enter in your Card Connect merchant ID to enable the integration. Um, so there's a bunch of different little add-ons um, for you to use. And one of the add-ons I wanna point out, um, just so that you know, is, is um, we have a label printer manager add-on. So this will allow for you to um, be able to print from any device to your label writer if you wanted to. We also have a time clock add-on as well, which allows for your staff members, whenever they log into Better, the software will prompt them to clock in and then they can clock out and then you can actually run the, a, a timesheets report um, to keep track of that at the end of the week or at the end of the month, whenever you want to. Um, so there's a bunch of different add-ons. So take some time and go to the settings module whenever you have a chance and click on this add-ons tab and scroll through and see if there's anything that could be of use to you. And um, just make sure you read that description as well in case you're not familiar with, with um, the add-ons name in general. So if you don't know what Ally DVM is, is then this description will, will help you um, get you a little bit more information about that. Um, and of course, reach out to support as well. If you need help enabling or using any of these integrations or if you have any questions at all, make sure you reach out to support and just let us know what those questions are. We'll get those answered right away for you. Um, okay, so now um, I wanna go over, so we're still in the settings module. And I want to go over some advanced configurations for you. So in the settings module, if you click on this configuration drop down menu, you'll see you have, you'll see that you have a couple different options that you can select between. Um, and I am going to focus on just a few of them today. Um, and so one I want to point out is the appointment types. So in Vetter, whenever you book an appointment, you are prompted to select an appointment type. So here, let me show you what I mean by that. So when I go to book an appointment, the first field it asks me is to select the type of appointment. And so the appointment type will have a default duration and it will also have a color that it appears on the schedule. So each appointment type, when you go and you book them on the schedule, the, the, you, can actually, you can actually set them to be different colors. So, so when you actually look at the schedule, you're able to just kind of quickly decipher between um, the, the blocks that are on your schedule um, based off the color. Um, um, that's, that's the general idea of it. Uh, so here, let me show you. Over on the settings module, you'll see if I click on configuration and select view appointment types, here's a list of our appointment types that we have added so far. And so this is a list of the existing appointment types. If you haven't actually added any appointment types yet, um, you can always add an appointment type by clicking this configuration drop-down menu and by selecting new appointment type. And so the fields here, whenever you enter an appointment type, um, this is the first one's gonna be the name of the appointment type. So you know if it's like wellness, visit, surgery, dental, you know, whatever type of appointments that you generally see in the clinic, you're gonna wanna create them as appointment types. The next field is asking you for the default duration. So when I go and I select the appointment type, you can see the duration of the appointment is filled in by default for me based off of the appointment type that I selected. So I selected, for example, if I select orbital evaluation, my duration is set to 30 minutes. So, so it's basically, it inputs that by default. Now you can always 
whenever you're booking an appointment, you know, increase the time if you need to or change the time. But by default, it will select that duration. So that's what that duration is. Now for the color, you can select any color that you want. And you can manipulate the, the, um, the palette just by kind of changing. You can just drop this little lever down on the right hand side to select a specific color. And then you can select the shade of the color um, over on the left hand side to get the exact color that you're looking for. And you can also type in hex color codes as well. So if you actually have the actual color code, you can just type it in as well. If you'd like a specific shade, like, you know, Tar Heel Blue, for example, uh, that option's available for you. Um, now, there are some other options that go along with appointment types as well. And, and these pertain to um, whenever you're booking the appointment. So if I'm booking an appointment, for a specific appointment type, I can actually set what the default confirmation message is along with the default reminder message. So here you can see this drop down menu showing me a list of letter templates. Um, and later we will talk about letter templates. Um, and you'll find out later that letters are pre formatted text documents. So you can actually map a specific letter template to your confirmation message that you email out whenever you book an appointment for this specific appointment type. Um, these two fields, actually, the medical note and the bundle, this refers to whenever you check in the appointment. So when I check in an appointment of this specific appointment type, I can already have the medical note that I want to create and use for today's visit already pre-selected. And a bundle is a grouping of inventory items. So I can also have a bundle pre-selected. So as soon as I check in the appointment, I can go ahead and I can actually add a grouping of items to the invoice for my client or create a bunch of records on the patient's profile at the same time by using that bundle. And then you also have some other options as well. Um, these, these pertain to our online appointment booking add-on. If you select to use that, you can actually set your appointment types to allow for online booking. Uh, and then checkout documents, this pertains to whenever you check out your client. Um, so if you check out a client that had an appointment using this specific appointment type, I can have some checkout documents already pre-selected and I can actually select exactly what those are. So as soon as I check out my client, those checkout documents will already be ready to export during checkout as well. And of course, And of course, whenever you go and you um, book an appointment, there is a specific order these appointment types appear as. Um, and you are able to edit and manipulate that order just by going to view appointment types. And you'll see there's a little kind of little cube icon over on the left hand side. And this will allow for you to drag and drop whichever order you would like these appointment types to appear at. Um, as and so if you if if you have an appointment type that you use more often than others it would be a good idea to, to add that to the top because that will be the appointment type selected by default so it'd be the one at the very top so as soon as you book the appointment that will already be pre-selected essentially all right all right okay so that's a little bit of information about appointment types um, so let's talk about another advanced configuration let's talk about late fees let's talk about late fees so if you go to the settings module and you scroll down, um, you'll see there's a list of a bunch of different configurations that you can set up for your clinic. Like for example, like how, the way the dates are formatted, the way that they appear essentially, um, or, or you know, what time zone the, the, the times of the clinic appear as, um, or, or what the services location. So there's a bunch of different little options for you to configure for your account right here. Um, one that I really want to kind of dig into, though, um, is going to be this payment terms configuration. Um, so if you, the payment terms, this is where you're going to go and set up exactly when payment is due. And also, if you are guys, if you guys are planning to apply late fees to um, invoices that are overdue. Um, so here, if you click this little uh, edit icon over on the right hand side, this will allow for you to um, make changes to your payment terms. 
And so the first thing that you're going to establish is when payment is due for your clients. So when services are provided, how long does your client have to um, admit payment? So, so if, if, serv if, if payment is due as soon as the services are provided, then you're going to want to select due upon receipt. If payment is due 30 days after the services are provided, then you'll, you'll want to select net 30. So that's what the payment terms are. First, we need to establish when payment is due after the services are performed. And so once you establish that, then you can actually select to either not apply late fees or to apply late fees. And if you do select to apply late fees, then you're going to select what that late fee is. So is it 1.5%? of the total due or is it or is it an actual dollar value where it's like a ten dollar fee or a five dollar two dollar fee is added to their invoice um and then you then you're going to select the frequency is this a monthly late fee where it it, it if it if it is set up monthly after each month that goes by that 1.5 percent is going to be added to the invoice or that that dollar value will be added to the invoice or is it a one-time fee where if payment is not due upon receipt and five days after due, a 1.5% charge will be added to the invoice. So that's the next field, right? Is, is the starting, is when after it is past due, do these late fees start to apply? So if the payment is due upon receipt, so if services are provided and payment is not received, Five days after it is due, the late fee is going to be applied to the invoice um, with a 1.5% of the total due on the invoice. And then the next section you can, you can select is, is, do you want to apply this to all open invoices? Or do we want to apply this to an invoice that has at least a certain amount due? So, so do we really want to apply late fees to invoices that have you know, only a $10 balance on it? Um, or do we only want to apply late fees to invoices that have a balance of at least $100, for example? So you can actually select that option right here in the total due. And then finally, the apply to. Do we want to this to apply to all unpaid invoices that are currently in our clinic? Or do we only want this to apply to new invoices that are created after saving these payment terms? And so you do have the ability to make that selection as well. And so once ever, whenever you make that selection and save these payment terms, and then that global setting will then be applied. And if you do opt to have it applied to all unpaid invoices, um, then it will be applied to any invoice that's currently past due. Or if you have it applied to new invoices, then it will only be applied to invoices um, uh, whenever you generate them later on. All righty, all righty. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about um, is going to be about email defaults. So this is another advanced configuration. And um, email defaults basically means whenever you go to email certain things out of Vetter, like an invoice, for example, or a receipt, for example, you have full control over the message that is sent along with that invoice or that receipt or, or that patient's history. And let me show you, let me show you how that works. So if you click on settings and click on this configuration drop down menu, you can select view email defaults. And this will show you a list of all of the different types of emails that you can actually send out of better. So you can see whenever I email an estimate, for example, or whenever I email an invoice, um, it is this subject line that is used. Um, and then it is the body of this document that is used. So, so if I click this little pen and paper icon, I can change the subject line. So this will actually be the subject line of the email that's sent over to your client. Now for the body, the actual message you can see there's a bunch of different options. These again are our letter templates. And letters again are reformatted text documents that you can include data variables in that will populate data based off of the client or patient who this is being sent over to. 
And so you can see right here, you can either have the option of using the system default message. So we actually have a system default message for each of these emails that are sent out and they're totally fine to use. Um, but if you do want to customize them, you can create a, a, a letter template for the body of the message that you want to use. And then all you have to do is just select that letter right here um, within this body field. And then you can click this little floppy disk icon to save your changes. And then the body of that, basically that letter will be used as the body of the email that's sent out whenever an appointment is accepted, for example, or, or if I'm emailing a receipt to my client, I could have um, a, a custom body sent out as well. And so, and don't worry, I am going to go over how to create letters and, and, and kind of walk you through what those are as well in just a couple of minutes. Um, there's just a few things I want to explain first before we get into templates. Um, and one of those things that I want to go over real quick um, is going to be taxes. So I want to make sure you're, you're fully aware of how to enter in new taxes and, and basically how they work, how they calculate um, and, and things like that. So for that, we're going to still be in our settings module. And I'm going to click on this configuration drop down menu. Now to add a new tax into my system, I'm going to click new tax right here. And so I'm going to see a window that looks like this. This tax field, this is the name of the tax. This is the, the name that, that uh, of the tax that it will appear in your reports, for example. Um, so if this was like a California state tax, right? I could do, you know, CA state tax. And then the rate is the actual tax rate. So here, if it's you know 7% or 6.5%, you can actually add that in. And then the type, this is the type of tax that you're adding in. So you can actually add multiple types of taxes in. You can add like a county tax, you can add a state tax, you can add a city tax, you can add multiple city taxes. If, if maybe it's a, a, you're a mobile clinic and you go to multiple um, jurisdictions, um, you can add in as many different taxes as you want. And the tax will always be calculated by the location of the invoice. So if the location of your invoice is set to your client's address, then the tax will be calculated based off your client's address. Or if the location of your invoice is set to in clinic and it uses your clinic's address, then it, the taxes will be calculated based off your clinic's address. And I'll show you how to enter in those addresses as well. So here, for example, if this was CA state tax, I'll go ahead and select state as my type. The jurisdiction is basically what that type is, right? So it's a state tax. So my jurisdiction is the state. So my, since it's a California state tax, my jurisdiction is California. So I'm gonna type in California, and then I'm going to select California from this dropdown list that appears. And then to, for the applies to section, I can either have this tax apply to all inventory categories, so this will apply to every single item in my inventory, or I can select specific inventory categories and I can actually select those actual specific categories. So maybe this applies to just my retail items and my diet products. So I can select just those options if that's what it applies to. And then I'm going to save it. So now we have our state tax entered into better. And while this is saving, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to open up this new tab really quick because I want to show you how to add in addresses in Vetter um, for either your clinic, for your client. Um, since we just learned that the location of the invoice is either set to, um, you know, a, an, is, is set to an address, right? It's either in clinic, it's the client's address, or maybe it's an address of a contact that has a relationship with the patient as well. Um, so that can be also used as a location of the invoice. So if you are actually, if you actually perform your services in clinic, and so you're, you're basically, you do everything on premise, um, this is how you can set your clinic's address. You click on the settings module, click on this configuration dropdown menu, and then select view addresses. And then from here, you actually have the ability to enter in the address. Um, so to make this clear for you, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to delete this extra address. You can actually add in multiple addresses if you wanted to. Um, and so here's our, here's this one address. And as you can see, 
Um, and this is what you'll see actually, you'll just kind of see like the name of your clinic and then kind of like this like blank fields right here. You're gonna wanna click the gear icon and select edit address. And then you can come through and you can actually write, you can actually type out that address here. Um, and so to type out the address, all you have to do is just type in the street number and street name. And then you're going to select the address from this drop down list that appears that says powered by Google. And whenever you do that, it will fill in the rest of the fields for you automatically. And it will also tie this address to Google Maps API. Um, so you'll actually be able to, if you actually you know, have like a county tax, for example, since this is tied to Google Maps, you'll be able to know exactly what county this address is in. And then from there, you'll be able to calculate the taxes appropriately. Um, so that's, that's how you would enter an address for your clinic. Now for your client, um, that's going to be entered on their profile. So let me pop open, let me actually pop open a client real quick and I can show you how that works. So here's a client's profile. If I click edit client, um, this, will give me the, uh, this will give me the ability to actually type in um, uh, their contact information. So you can see in this address field, I can do the same thing where I type in the street number and the street name, and then I select that address from this drop down list that appears. It will fill in the rest of the fields for me automatically, and it will tie this address to Google Maps' API. So that, that's the, basically, that's the process you want to follow whenever you go to enter in an address. Um, is you just want to type in the street number, street name, and then just select it from that drop-down list that appears. And then whenever you do that, you'll notice... Um, and let me just point out what the location of the invoice means, right? So if I click invoice right here, you can see that there's a location set. And I can always edit this invoice and change that location if I wanted to. And so whatever is set as the location of the invoice, that address is what's going to be used to calculate the taxes. So if it's in clinic, it's gonna be that clinic address that we entered earlier within the settings. If it's set to, um, you know, Granny Mountain, for example, is set to the client's address, then we'll use the actual client's address to calculate the taxes. Now you can actually you can actually establish which location is set by default within the settings module. So let me show you. If you go to the settings module and you kind of scroll down this little configuration list, you'll see that there is a services location option where it allows you to either select both on premise or mobile. So if you do select on premise, the in clinic location will be selected by default. If you select mobile, um, the client's address will be selected by default. So if you do have a preference right there, you can actually go and make that change in the settings if you wanted to. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about um, is going to be adding staff members, adding new staff members. Um, so, as you probably know, um, whenever you sign up for a subscription in Vetter, um, you're allotted a specific amount of users. And so, um, and you can, always, you can always edit your subscription too, by the way, by clicking this little um, drop down menu right here on subscriptions and select edit subscription. And then you can actually change your, this is the demo account, by the way, so it's just kind of like unlimited, unlimited, uh, but you'll actually have drop down menus that you can change. Uh, for your for your subscription plan and so if you do have some users that you need to add in into better um, what you're going to do is you're going to click on this little staff drop down menu and then you're going to select new staff and if you're allotted a certain amount of users like you know like one out of five or something like like you have five or like seven users um, you will actually click staff and select view active staff and you'll see an unassigned staff um, column um, listed um, um, within the staff section. Uh, now this list is gonna, it takes a little while to load because we have 199 staff members listed here. Um, and so anyways, um, you'll just click on the name, you'll just click on the unassigned staff and, and um, this will pull you open to a window that looks like this. And so here are the fields you'll enter when adding your staff member into your account. And um, so you'll, you'll type in the first last name um, and you're going to select a role. A, a role, um, as you can see, there's, there's, a, there's um, um, a few different roles that you can select between. And you have the ability to set the permissions 
for each of these roles. Um, and so here you can actually set, um, you can actually, you can actually uh, select which role you want to add the staff member over to. And so the role of the staff member and here, and so it's a good idea um, to make sure you select the appropriate reason, or, I'm sorry, the appropriate role, um, because the one that is selected by default is the administrator role. And that administrator role actually has permissions to do everything in better. Um, they can delete payments, they can do anything in better. Um, so if that's not what you want for your particular staff member you're adding, make sure you select, select the appropriate role that has the permissions enabled that you want for them to be able to do in, uh, within better. Now, the provider field. Um, so this is where you're going to select whether or not they are going to be listed as a provider. Um, and, and the provider, it doesn't have to just be for people within the veterinarian role. Um, you can actually make any staff member a provider if you would like. Um, and, and by making them a provider, um, that, that's something that will um, allow for you to um, set, as a, uh, set as the provider of records whenever you create records so that you can actually use the, uh, like the sales by provider report in the future in case you actually pay out based off production for your team. Um, or, or the payments by provider report. And so this right here, this is how you can designate whether or not your um, staff member that you're adding is a provider. The pay type, um, so you can see there's a different, there's um, either you can select hourly or salaried. Um, now, this actually plays a bigger part than just, just um, than just kind of detailing whether they're hourly or salaried. If you opt to use the time clock add-on, if you enable the time clock add-on um, by selecting hourly as the pay type for your staff member, um, that will prompt the software to ask them to clock in whenever they log in. Um, and then they'll be able to clock out and keep track of their, uh, their hours. Um, now, if you set them as salary, they will not be asked to clock in and they won't actually be able to clock in. So that's the difference between the pay type. Um, and, and it plays a little bit bigger part whenever you enable the time clock add-on. And then, of course, there's some other fields um, like the license, the DEA number, um, if this is actually a provider you're adding. Um, or um, you can actually add in um, uh, their contact information as well. Now, the first and the last name, and then also the email, these are the actual three required fields. The email is required because that is what your staff member uses to log into Better. Um, and so, and whenever you actually save this staff member, um, they will be emailed, or they'll be sent an email over to whatever email you enter here um, with a temporary password. So they'll use that email address and that temporary password to log into Better for the first time. And then whenever they're logged into Better, um, they'll just click on the drop down menu of their name and click change password. And then they can uh, uh, change their password to whatever they would like if they wanted to. And then finally, there's some other options over here. Um, there's an after hours option. So you can actually set whether or not they're able to log in after hours. Um, so you actually set your clinic hours within settings, um, but you can actually make it to where your staff, uh, your staff members can actually log in after hours if you don't want them to. And then finally, a time zone field. So if this staff member is actually a remote employee that works in a different time zone than the clinic, you can actually set their time zone for them to be different than the actual clinic's time zone. The default option will be default to clinic time zone. Now, let me show you how to enable the time clock add-on. Um, again, you're just going to go to settings, click on add-ons, and then scroll down to time clock. And then here, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to disable it, and then I'm going to re-enable it so I can show you guys what that looks like. Um, so whenever you scroll down to it, you'll see this little green plus sign next to time clock. And you just click on this little plus sign. And then um, 
you are able to, um, um, you can actually set some further settings, whether you want to round time down to the nearest um, 10 minutes, you know, five minutes, zero minutes for clock in and clock out. Uh, and then you can also um, check this little box right here to automatically log out users whenever they clock out. So as soon as they clock out, you can just log them right out if you want to. And then whenever you click enable, the time clock add-on will be enabled and any staff member that is set to an hourly pay type, whenever they log into Vetter, they will then be asked to clock in. Um, and um, to clock out, all they have to do is just click on the little drop down menu of their name. There'll be a little clock out option right here that they can select. Now to review the timesheets or to edit existing timesheets, um, if you click on the staff tab and select view active staff, um, if somebody makes a mistake on their timesheet, um, all you have to do is go over to their staff profile. So, um, for example, I'll just click on my name right here. And you can see right here under this timesheets, this will be a list of all of their time entries when they clocked in and clocked out. And you can always click the gear icon to the right side of it and select edit timesheet. And you can change that time. So if they messed up, the clock in the clock out or they forgot to clock out you can actually set you can actually just go in and change that for them um, if you wanted to uh, or you can actually add timesheets too so if you click on this timesheets and select new timesheet you can add in a time entry so if they forgot to clock in and clock out altogether you actually go ahead and you can add in that that entire clock in and clock out sequence as well now that's how you can edit timesheets so you're so you, you can basically edit the timesheets on the actual staff profile now to review the timesheets, you're actually gonna go over to the reports module. And so if you go to the reports module and click on the staff tab, um, you'll see there's a timesheets report. And so if you click on it, it will actually show you the timesheets for each one of your staff members. So the total amount of time that they worked and also every single clock and entry. And you can actually filter this report by clicking filter and you can filter it for whatever date range you want. So if I wanted to see last week's or last month's, you know, I can, you know, I can obviously filter that if I wanted to, um, or I can actually select those specific dates as well. Okay, so the next thing we're going to get into is uh, we're going to start talking about templates. So I mentioned earlier about letters. Um, I also mentioned about. Um, well, here, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. So here, if I click on the settings module, you'll see there's a templates drop-down menu right here. And so um, this templates drop-down menu is where you're going to go to create a few different types of templates. So to create a template, you'll click on this templates drop-down menu and select new template. And then this gives you an ability to select the type of template you're creating. So if I wanted to create a letter template, I would select letter. Or if I wanted to create a medical note template, I, I would select medical note. Um, so, so here are a bunch of different types that you can actually create or like a wellness plan, for example. Um, so let's start with one, let's start with one that, let me, let me talk a little bit about snippets. So a content snippet is a reusable piece Oh, sorry, is a, re is a reusable text, is, is basically it's reusable text that you can actually add into your communications. You can add it into your letters. Um, and you can also add it into your medical notes. So if you're recording notes within your SOAP, it's a way to add in this snippet, add in this reusable piece of text if it's something you um, don't want to have to write over and over again. Um, you can actually store it in better and then, and then use that in a, a medical note or a letter or a communication, um, just so you can just quickly add in that content. Um, so the title is just the title of the snippet. So here I'm gonna make a demo snippet, just to show you what this is about. I'm gonna call it demo snippet 23. Now you can actually associate a hashtag with the snippet. And the hashtag is cool because um, whenever you're working in a SOAP or a communication or a letter, you can actually just type in the hashtag and it will add in that reusable text for you. So it'll add in that content for you. So here, let me show you. I'm gonna type in demo23 as my hashtag. And I'm gonna click save. And then it's gonna take me over to my snippet screen right here where I can actually enter the content 
in this field. So if I have that paragraph that I need to type in, um, or maybe it's like a list, maybe it's like a list of information that I need to type in, or maybe it's a sentence. Um, whatever type of content that you use over and over again, you want to store in better and be able to quickly access it, just save it as a content snippet. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to save this right here. And, and let me just put in some, a little bit about, let me just put a little bit of information in here. Just be, see, okay. And I'm going to save it. And so if I'm in a, um, here, let's say, for example, I'm going to go over to, um, let me go over to this patient's profile. And let me go ahead, I'm going to open up a medical note. So I can show you kind of what the, how to basically what the snippet is going to do here. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to open up this basic medical note right here. This is perfect. All right. Um, okay. So I'm in the demo account. So obviously I, it looks like I selected a medical note that actually has no content somebody created for some reason. All right, let's select Barry Soap right here and we'll just add it to, um, we'll add it to a patient. All right, all right. So here's our soap and um, here's our medical note. And so as you can see, I'm in this field right here, right? And so to add my snippet into this field, maybe I have some information for this note section for the problems. Um, all I'm gonna do is just type in my hashtag. Right. And so I, and as you see, if I start typing in the first few letters, it'll show me the keyword matches. If I type out the whole thing, I can just click on that. And my content will be added in for me. So content snippets is just a great way of just using reusable pieces of text and to, to be able to store information that you can just kind of just pull from at any time and just, and just basically paste it into the uh, uh, medical note or the letter or, or, or a communication that you're writing up for one of your clients. Um, if you happen to forget the hashtags, um, you can click on this medical note and select add snippet. This is another way of adding snippets into your account. And you can see if you actually click on the snippets, you can see in the parentheses the actual hashtag you have associated with it in case you need to memorize those. Um, or you can actually just select it from here to add it as well. Okay, so let me show you where the snippets are stored in case you ever need to edit them or delete them. Um, so if you go to the settings module and click on this templates tab, you can select view snippets and this will show you all of the snippets that have been added to your account. And you can click on them, click on the name to actually go over to them to edit them or you can click the gear icon and select edit template um, or you can delete them as well. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about are going to be about letters. So letters are pre-formatted text documents. Common uses of letters would be something like a discharge letter or maybe a prescription letter that needs to be sent over or, or maybe a space slash neuter certificate. Um, so you can create a letter by clicking on in the settings tab, click on this templates drop-down menu and then by selecting new template. And then we're gonna change the type to letter. And then the title's going to be whatever that letter is, right? So here, demo letter 23. I'm gonna save that. So here's my letter. So as you can see, the letter has a blank canvas over here on the right-hand side. And then a couple expandable options over here on the left-hand side. These expandable options are what we refer to as data variables. So the way that a letter works is something like this, right? So I'd write hi, and then go over to my recipient information, and then grab my recipient's first name and add it in. And so whenever I add the letter to a client's account or a patient's account, um, the recipient of that letter, their first name will populate in this data variable. So when, when my client looks at this, that's sent over to them. It will say, hi, Nancy. And then I can even go as, you know, as far as, you know, it was great seeing you and, and then I can, for example, expand the patient information section and select name. It was great seeing you and Tiger today. 
And so as you can see, I can, I can basically, I can add in whatever type of, of data that I want to populate in the letter as I'm building it based off of what type of letter I'm creating. Um, now you can also add tables to the letter. So you can see there's a little table option right here. If I hover over this little table icon, hover this table, I can select out the grid of, you know, how many columns and rows will be created for my table. And I can, I can actually type in like, you know, like patient and then, and then add in, you know, that information, right? So like, you know, patient name and then weight and then, you know, grab the patient's current weight. And so I can, you know, organize my data in kind of like a table structure if I want. Um, as you can see, there's like little dashes around the table. Um, so, so this, this particular table, whenever I go and I export it for my client, it will not appear with solid lines around the table. The content will be organized as it's in the table. Um, but since there's little dash lines, there won't be any kind of solid lines. If you want to make these lines solid, you'd actually click into the table and then select the table properties option right here. And then for border width, you'd actually set this to any value greater than zero. The, the, great, the bigger the value, the, the thicker the line for the border, um, by the way. But now you can see it's kind of like an actual solid line. And, and when I go to export this letter, um, it will actually be tables with lines um, for the borders. Um, now you can also kind of manipulate uh, like the font in there. Like, like, for example, I can, you know, I can make this recipient's first name, you know, in like appear as a, like, you know, a red shade, for example, um, or I can do that highlight effect on the, on the, you know, the day that we're, we're expecting to see them. Um, um, or, or maybe I want to like manipulate the size of the font. So, so for that, I'm actually going to be using these headers. So as you can see, if I select a specific header, that, that kind of changes the size of the font. Um, another thing that you can do is you can actually include um, a signature field for your letter. And so um, the cool thing about that is um, you, you have two different signature fields that you can use. You can either use like an author signature field. So it's the author that's set for the letter. So whoever's actually sending the letter their, their, their signature off their staff profile will populate in the letter. Um, that would be useful if maybe you're creating like a spay or neuter certificate and you want, you want like your veterinarians, your provider's information to appear at the bottom of the letter. Um, you would include like the author signature. If you are creating a letter to actually collect your client's signature, um, you're going to want to expand the letter information section right here and select signature field. And so, this will actually allow for you to actually collect your client's signature electronically. Um, so let me show you that. Let me actually show you how that works. So I'm going to save this letter and we're going to go over, we're going to scoot on over to um, a patient's profile real quick. So here I'm going to go over to this patient's um, um, soap that we're working in and I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to add this letter really quick. So now, as you can see, if I select documents, new letter, this is how I can add a letter. I'm currently in a SOAP adding the new letter, but it works the same way if I'm over in a patient's profile or a client's profile, you will also find a documents tab there where you can select new letter as well. And so here I can actually, you know, for example, where we're using our demo letter 23. So I'll go ahead and just continue using that. And so as you can see, when I'm adding the new letter, I can, I can specify the owner um, and, and so if I have, maybe if I have some owner information data variables in there, whichever owner I select, that's whose, that's whose information will populate in that letter. If I have some recipient variables here, it's whoever I select as the recipient is whose information is going to populate. Um, if, if I, whoever I select as the author, if I have author data variables, it's the authors, whoever I select as the author, that person's information is going to populate. And so whenever you make those selections and click save, it's now going to create that letter. And so you can see that the, uh, the information actually populates, right? So hi, Barney, and then patient saver, weight 13 pounds. Now, if the information, if the data is not available, then it'll appear with this little dash symbol. 
So we have not yet collected our client's signature, so it appears with this little dash symbol. Now we can actually edit this letter by clicking edit, and we can like et change like anything. We can add more data variables, just actually just record free form text in here if we wanted to, and just save those changes, and that will actually add it to the letter. Now to collect your client's signature, you're actually going to want to click this sign letter option at the top. And so whenever you click the sign letter option, you can actually, you know, if you have a tablet, you can hand it over. Your client can use their finger or stylus, um, or like if you have a computer that, you know, a trackpad or a mouse, and they can actually, you know, write out their signature, however it is, or they can click this type it and actually type it out. And then whatever, however they sign electronically, that will actually then be added to the letter. And then you can always just export this letter at any point, or you can just store this record, uh, this letter on the patient's profile or the client's profile. Now, another thing I want to point out to you is that when you are creating different letter templates in Vetter, um, if maybe you wanted to use an existing letter template that you have as kind of like the backbones for a new letter that you're creating, um, a really cool or a really good option for you is if you go to that letter. So if I go to templates, view letters, um, I can click the gear icon to the right side of this letter and I can select duplicate. And by doing that, it's going to create a copy of that letter. Um, so it's kind of like the Microsoft save as function where, where you're able to make changes to this letter that doesn't affect the previous version. So the original version stays intact and I can create a new copy of it where I can manipulate and change it um, to make some changes and then I can create it and I can basically create a new iteration of it. Um, so you just wanna just change the title to whatever you'd like and then, and then whenever you do that, that will actually just create that same letter for you, um, that, you, can, that, you can, that you can update and edit. Okay, so that's a little bit about letter templates. Um, Let's talk a little bit about medical notes. All right, so medical note is our way of saying soap. Um, so you may refer to soaps, or you may refer to medical notes as soaps. Um, now, we actually add in a couple pre-made medical note templates for you to use. Um, and, and those, you know, those have some information on them. Um, but you're actually able to create your own medical note. You actually create, create your own template. And you can actually include all of the different fields that you would like in the order that you would like. So, so let me walk you through how that works. If you click on this templates drop down menu and select new template, you can change the type to medical note. And then here we can we can uh, type in the title of that soap. So I'm gonna say demo soap 23, save that. And so you're gonna see a screen that looks like this. We have a blank canvas over here on the right-hand side, and then we have some expandable options over on the left-hand side. Now you'll see what happens when I click this subjective section, it's gonna add in every field within that subjective field, within that subjective section. So you can see if I, if I actually expand these options, everything is checked whenever I, whenever I check the, uh, the top one on the hierarchy. So if I uncheck it, um, I can actually just deselect all of those options at the same time. And so you can see when you actually expand them out, this is how you can go into like a little bit further detail. So you can actually select the fields that you want to add in. Um, so maybe I wanna add in a field for diet, exercise, and appetite. So for that, I can just go ahead, I can select appetite, I can select diet, and then I can select exercise. And so now you can see it's just the fields that I want to add in that are actually added in to my template over here. Um, but maybe I actually want the order to be a little bit different. Maybe I want to um, record my notes about diet um, and then record my notes about exercise right after and then follow up with an appetite. And this is the order that I like to just kind of push through. Um, so you can see if you if you click on this little these little cube icon over on the left hand side, it allows for you to drag and drop to adjust that order. Um, now you can also add in more and more sections as well. So if I wanted to, I can you know expand the assessment section, 
and I can go ahead and I can add in, you know, like the diagnoses, for example, or maybe I want to expand the objective section and I want to add in um, my vital signs and I want to add in a vital sign for uh, weight and temperature. And so, so here you can just go through and you can actually add in as many different fields as you would like in the order that you would like. And on top of that, you actually have the ability to pre-populate field information. So if maybe something is the same all the time and you don't want to have to write it over and over again, um, you can actually write that in here. You know, obviously the, within normal limits doesn't apply to diet, right? But just for example, we can, we can pre-populate text here. And this, whatever's written in here, when you go and you add this SOAP template to a patient's profile, um, this text will already be written in for the field for you to save you some time. And then same thing for the values. You can actually pre-select these values as well in your template. So if I want this weight, you know, to say grams by default, like I can already have that pre-selected if I wanted to. Um, or I can type in text and have that pre-selected. So you can pre-populate field information. Now, let's say for example, um, I'm in my objective section, I'm in my abdomen section within the objective, and I want a field that says stomach X notes. I wanna add in a field that says stomach X notes. But under this abdomen section, I don't see any fields like that. And I can't add in that field because it doesn't exist. Um, so you do have your way, you do have a way to create custom fields. So to create a custom field, you'll go to the settings module, click on the templates drop down menu, and then select new template. And then from here, change the type to custom field. And then the title is going to be what that actual field is. So it's the title of the field. So if it was stomach X notes, like I was saying, I'm going to type in the title stomach X notes. Uh, values, so that is the drop down menu that you saw next to the field. So if you wanted to, you can actually include values like abnormal and normal. And if you are going to include values, you're just going to add them as words on separate lines within this values field right here. So just put, put each value you would like in separate lines. And then you can opt, you can opt to select where you like to include it. So remember, I want to include it in the objective section within my abdomen subsection. And then I can save that. So not only do you have the ability to select which fields you're using, you actually have the ability to create your own fields if you wanted. So now you'll see if I go back to my SOAP template that we were just working in. Um, you'll notice if I expand my objective section and expand the abdomen section, um, I now have this stomach X notes field that I can add in. And since I did add values to it, I now have this little drop down list next to it as well that I can select between. And again, I can pre select which value is selected by default and then which um, I can also pre populate text as well. And so here we can go ahead and we can add in as, you know, as many different fields as we wanted to as well. And we can put them in whichever order we want as well. Um, and we can even like, we can even get really crazy with the objective section first if we want to. Um, and then all you have to do is just remember to click save when you're done making your changes to your SOAP template. Um, and then once ever, whenever you save it, um, all you have to, um, whenever you go and you create this medical note. So if I go and I add a new medical note for my patient, And um, here, we'll just use that patient we're using. Or we'll just use a random patient, actually. And I'll go ahead and um, grab my demo soap 23. I'll save it. And so this is, I'm basically, I'm just quickly creating medical note just to show you what we did. Um, so as you can see, this is the medical note that we created as a template. And so here, it's in, this, it's in the order that we've added it. And as you can see, the uh, values are already pre-selected as I've set them in the template. And then, and then any kind of 
uniquely populated text is already populated for us as well. Okay, so the next thing we're talking about are bundles. So a bundle is a grouping of inventory items. So it's a way to add multiple charges to an invoice all at the same time, or to create multiple records on a patient's profile all at the same time. Um, so if, if generally, it, it, and the cool thing is you can actually tie a bundle to an appointment type. So whenever you check in an appointment of a specific appointment type, that bundle that you have uh, selected will, will actually be pre-selected. Um, so it's just a great way of just kind of expediting the process. Um, so like if you guys have like, a, like you know, they, you're, you're, the, the patient comes in for their annual visit. And during their annual visit, they usually get like, you know, a, a rabies, a, a bordetella, um, um, or like a nail charm, whatever, whatever you would like to, to use and combine together and, and save you time. That, that's generally what a bundle is used for. Um, so to create a bundle, super simple. You just click on this templates drop down menu and select new template. And then from here, um, change the type to bundle. And then here you can, the title will be whatever the name of the bundle is going to be that you'll use to select in the future. So I'll make it bundle 23. All right, so you're gonna see a window that looks like, that looks like this. To add items to this bundle, you're gonna click items, new item. Type in the name of the item in your inventory. You can select the item. And then here you can already pre-select the quantity that the item should be added to the invoice as. Um, and then you can also select whether to use the default price from inventory or to use a custom price. So you do have the ability to add the item to a bundle multiple times if you would like to, to have multiple different price options to use for the same item in your inventory. You do have the ability to do that. Um, and then whenever you click save and done, that will just add the item to the bundle. Um, now, Another thing that you can do to help save you a little bit of time is you can actually add bundles to bundles. So if you have another bundle created that you want to use as the backbone for this bundle, you can click items, new bundle. You can actually add a bundle worth of items to the bundle to save you even more time if you'd like. Um, now, whenever you do start adding items to the bundle, there is an actions drop down menu for this particular bundle. In actions are events that are triggered whenever a record is created. Actions are added to your items in your inventory. Um, so as soon as you add an item to a bundle, the bundle will inherit the actions from that inventory item. Um, but you can always go through this little actions tab and you can remove any actions that you do not want to trigger for this record. Um, or you can actually edit the action as well, or even add a new action. So you can actually have actions that trigger only when the item is used under a particular bundle. Um, okay, so now let's go over the inventory real quick. There's a couple different things I wanna highlight within the inventory module. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is how to search for your items in your inventory that you have already entered into the inventory. Um, you'll notice there's a little search bar in the top right corner right here. So all you have to do is just type in the name of the item. And then, and then this will show you a little drop-down list of re, with results that match the keywords of the items in your inventory. So if I'm looking for my rabies item, I can select type in rabies, and then I can click on, you know, Andrea rabies, for example, to navigate over to that inventory item. And as you can see, every item in your inventory is actually added to a particular category. Um, so let me show you over um, on the, uh, in the inventory module, there is a categories tab, which will allow for you to view all of the different subcategories within each category type. And also allows for you, um, and it will also allow for you to add new categories as well. So if you click categories, new category, um, here you can select what type of category it is and then also create that new subcategory. Um, so categories, those are important because, um, Um, uh, basically, when you start running reports later on for um, um, like your inventory summary, for example, or, or your inventory value report, um, or maybe like you want to use the sales by category report, 
um, by accurately placing your items into the appropriate category, that will make, um, that will, um, uh, make for a better, more positive experience when you're reporting, using your reporting later on. Uh, and also items behave a little bit differently between each category. Um, for example, you have a category for administrative fees. Um, so any, so basically to create a fee, you would actually create an inventory item and you would place it within the category of administrative fees. Um, and then by doing that, that would then allow for that item to be a selectable option for your inventory items as an embedded fee. So this bad customer fee, for example, um, the reason that that is a selectable option that I'm able to include is because that was added within the fees category. Um, so that's just a little kind of a little bit of information about why categories are important and how they can be useful. Um, and again, remember if you click on inventory and click categories and select view categories, um, this is where you can go to view existing categories to edit them and also where you can go to delete them as well. So if you no longer want to use them as a category, you do have the option to delete the category. Um, but the only way to actually delete a category is if no items are currently in it. So you wanna make sure you move your items over to a new category before you actually uh, delete the category because every item needs to have a category. Okay, so let's walk through a little bit quickly about how to add new items into our inventory. Um, so on the inventory module, you can either click new item or click our little shortcut menu and select new inventory item. And that'll take you over to the same screen. Um, the first field is the name field. So this is the name of your inventory item. Whatever name you type here, this is what you will search for in your inventory to locate this item. It's also the name you'll search for when adding this item to an invoice or creating a record flow. The display name is the name that your client will see. So the display name is what your client will see. So whenever you go to export an invoice, and if this item happens to be included on it, um, they will see that display name. Or if a, a, a medical reminder is emailed over to your client, they will see the display name. Um, the next field is, is to select the category. So here you can um, select the appropriate category. Um, there is a controlled field. And so as you can see, I'm in the administrative fees. I'm in a category in the administrative fees, and I don't have the option for anything except for to set the price of the fee. But if I change the category, for example, to canine immunizations, you can see I have, I can access these fees. So that's, that's essentially why categories are so important. Now, if this is a controlled substance, I have a field that I can flag this as a controlled. And if I do that, um, within my reports module, I can run my controlled substances log later and it will actually track any item that has been marked as controlled. So it will track the purchases, the revenue, um, um, when it was administered, the amount that was administered. And that all starts from, from marking it as a controlled. Now, the concentration, the dose range, the dose, um, these are all defaults that you'll enter for your item in your inventory. Um, if you want to utilize the dosage calculator later on. So you enter in these defaults and then, and then later when you go to create a record or add an item to an invoice, there'll be a dosage calculator that you can use and it will pull these defaults from your item in the inventory and it will also pull the patient's weight and then it will recommend a specific dose for your client. Um, now, the other fields available for you um, are going to be um, some price options. So you can see there's a base price. So we can either set it as a fixed base price. So this base price is how much we will charge our client per base quantity. So, you know, one unit would cost, you know, $25, for example, and I could set that. Um, or I could use a percent markup. And by using a percent markup, this is gonna utilize the purchase that I've entered for my inventory item. So you actually enter new purchases to add stock for your inventory item. And you can actually create a percent markup. So if I go percent of latest cost, for example, and then my base right here, I could just set it to 250% of latest cost if I wanted to. The minimum price is a price floor. 
So it's a price that the price um, that the uh, that can that the uh, the charge on the invoice can never go below. So say my my base price is ten dollars is 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 ten per unit, right? Um, but I have my minimum price set to twenty to twenty five dollars. Even if I sell one unit or two units, my client will still be charged twenty five dollars. Um, the price can never drop below the minimum price that 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 is a price floor. A fee is an embedded fee. So if I add like a five dollar embedded fee um, to this item, if I add like a little five dollar embedded fee to this item, um, what's going to happen is is the 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 base price the unit price is going to be calculated. So if I sell one unit for my client right? $10 will be charged. And then this $5 embedded fee will be included with that. So my client will actually be charged $15 at that point. Um, the base quantity is the lowest. You want to set this as the lowest denomin dom denominator that you will be selling this item for or this item as, right? So if, if I have like a moxicillin, for example, and I sell it by the, the, the tablet, then I'm going to want to set it to one tablet, for example. So here I can actually change the unit of measure over here too. So I can change it to one tablet. And so if I end up selling a bottle, then I, I would set the quantity as 100 on the invoice um, because my base quantity of my, my inventory item is set to one tablet. So we're selling it by the tablet. So I'm charging $10 per tablet right here. The route and location you can fill in. Um, and this will actually set the default route and location whenever you go to create the record. You know, so if it was like a moxicillin, it'd be like oral and, and then mouth, for example. The next do is going to basically, if you establish a next do right here, like say I do 12 months, um, it's going to enter the next due date for the record to be 12 months after the given date. And by doing that, that will actually automatically create a reminder in the patient's reminder summary um, showing that the patient is due for this, this uh, medical item um, uh, for that particular date. And then the instructions, you can also fill in some default instructions as well, and those will print on the prescription label. Uh, now here, I'm gonna go over to an item that exists in our inventory right now. So I'll go back to my Andrea Ravies. And um, one thing that you can utilize is price tiers. And so price tiers is a way to basically set a discount whenever a max quantity is provided. Um, so let, let me kind of give you an example. Let's say um, if I sell six units, I want a 10% discount to kick in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this price tiers and I'm gonna select new tier. And I'm first gonna set a max quantity of five. And I'm gonna make sure it says five with 0% discount. And I'm gonna go ahead and save that. And then I'm gonna click price tiers and select new tier and I'm gonna set the max quantity to six and then actually set the 10% discount. So now you can see if anywhere between one to five units are sold, there will not be a discount. But if six units or if more than six units are sold to the client, then a 10% discount will come into effect. Um, so that's, that's basically how the price tiers work. And, and, and I could even make it to where, you know, if, if I sell 12 units, then a 15% discount kicks in. So here I'll go to max quantity 12 and then put my discount 15%. And so by doing that, one to five units is a 0% discount six to 11 units is a 10% discount, and then 12 and further would be a 15% discount. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about are actions. So actions are events that are triggered whenever a record is created. Um, and so you can click on this little actions dropdown menu within your uh, item in your inventory and select new action. And then from here, you can go ahead and you can see there's a bunch of different options for you available. Um, um, like change patient status, for example. Maybe you guys have like a euthanasia item. And so whenever you create a record for that euthasol item, um, it can automatically change the patient status to deceased. 
And then you can even go as far as deactivating the existing reminders as well. Um, or maybe you want to have a create reminder action where it's an email type reminder. So, so whenever this rabies record, this Andrea rabies item is invoiced, um, a reminder will automatically be created and then emailed over to your client, however far in advance you have it set up. So actions are events that are triggered whenever a record is created. And so uh, another action could be like a disable reminder action where if this item is invoiced, then it will disable whatever reminder that is currently on the patient's profile that I would like for it to. Um, or maybe I could do a create action for an alert. So I can actually set a low balance or an expiration alert. So whenever this specific inventory item um, approaches the low balance threshold that I have set, um, I can be notified of that within my inventory dashboard. I can see that alert. And that will alert me that I need to, to order more stock for this inventory item. Um, or I can set an expiration, which will let me know whenever my lots are approaching expiration. Uh, or maybe I want to set an action as a create task. So maybe I want to actually create a task and have it assigned to a specific staff member. So maybe it's a surgery item. And whenever I invoice the surgery item, um, I want a task created and assigned to my technicians that lets them know um, that lets them know that they need to call the client and check on the patient's uh, recovery after that surgery. And so I can actually just type in that task, whatever the task is here, uh, and I can create that action. So there's a couple different actions that can be useful and can automate some of your processes. Um, and that's all found within this little actions drop down menu. Um, now let's talk about purchases. So if I want to enter in the stock for my item in my inventory, I'm going to click purchases and select new purchase. And then here I'm going to select a provider. If you do not have any providers entered as of right now, um, you can do so by clicking on this contacts tab and by selecting new company. So contacts new company is how you add in suppliers um, so that there'll be selectable options. And so here I'll select my supplier. And then I can, I can add in some optional manufacturer information. I can set the date of this purchase. Um, I can type in the lot number, whatever the lot number is. I can set an expiration date for this purchase as well. I can establish the quantity that I'm purchasing and the cost that is associated with that purchase as well. And whenever you save that, you'll see that it adds that balance to the overall balance in your inventory. Um, now, if something goes wrong with one of your lots, like something um, you, you lose a lot, you, um, it's defective, it's recalled, it expires, what you'll want to do is you want to go to your item in your inventory, click purchases, view purchases, and then go to that lot that expires, for example, and click the gear icon and select adjust balance. And so if this lot expires right here, I'm going to go ahead and set the actual balance to zero. And then I can set my, my reason as well. And I can save that. And then by doing that, you'll see that it will make that adjustment. So there's no longer a balance for that lot. And you can see my overall balance has changed as well. Um, if ever these numbers, if ever the sum of all of the purchases do not match this current balance number, you're going to want to make a top level adjustment, which you can do from this adjustments drop down menu right here by selecting new adjustment. And any number you write here, that is what the current balance will be set to. So if there's ever a discrepancy between the purchases and the current balance, make sure you make that top level adjustment here. Um, because the current balance needs to match the sum of all of the purchases and um, so that the software will know um, which lot to pull from. If the current balance is off um, and it doesn't match the purchases, then um, uh, the software will not accurately pull from the correct lot. Um, by default, the, the software is, is, um, um, is set to pull from the lot that is set to expire most recently but you can always change that at the time of creating the record. Um, or you can always, by the way, if you enter a purchase incorrectly, you can always edit the purchase to change that information you've already um, entered while adding the purchase, or you can actually just delete it as well if it's an irrelevant entry.
or if it was just made a missing by if or if there was an error made. Now, you can also um, now you also have the ability to bulk update your inventory. And you also have the ability to also order from our integrated supplier. So if you actually, in the add-on section, if you have like, if you actually order from MWI, there's actually like an MWI integration, for example, you can actually place an order to MWI directly within Vetter. Um, and then you can actually submit the order to MWI. And then um, whenever you receive that order, you can just post the receipt and actually post the stock to your inventory items. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, another thing you can do is you can actually bulk update your inventory. So if you go to the inventory, um, there is a bulk update option up at the top of the screen. And, and, and you can have this bulk update either apply to specific items in your inventory, which you can select right here, or specific categories. So I can make an update that, is, that applies to the, all of the items in a particular category if I wanted to. Um, or multiple categories as well. And then for the update, you're actually going to select what that update is. So maybe I want to create an action for all of the items in that, that category all at the same time. Or maybe I want to do an increased price. So I want to increase the price by a certain percent. So all of my dentistry items are going to be increased by 3%. So at this point, I can type in, you know, three for the percent right here. Um, so that's what this bulk update is. It's just a way to, to make um, a bunch of different updates all at the same time. And you can have them either apply to specific items or specific categories worth of items. Okay, and then the final thing we're gonna talk about today is going to be about the reports module. So if you click on this reports tab right here, you can see there's a list of, of, of reports and each of the reports are actually grouped by function. And all data is actually provided in real time. So any changes you make, you can go and you can run that report right after and you will see that data has been changed. And so some common reports that you'll be running would be something like the accounts receivable report. So I'd, I would, we would find that in the billing section. And so in the billing section, for example, we have our accounts receivable report. And our accounts receivable report will actually show us a list of clients that owe us money. And it will also show us a list of clients that we owe money to. So you're actually able to filter the report if you would like to. And so this, by the way, is the demo account. We have, that. We have lots of clients in here. Um, but, but I can actually filter the report. So you can see it actually lists clients that we owe money to. So this is a client that actually has a credit on their account. Um, if we click this filter option right here, we can actually change the total due from all to at least $1 or, or, or at least you know $500, for example, if we want to see just the list of clients that owe us over $500. Um, or if we select at least $1, that will show us just the list of clients that owe us money at that point. Um, so there is a filter option for every report and the different types of ways that you can actually filter the reports for um, differs based off of the specific type of report that you're running. So you'll have different filter options for each of the reports. Um, this one only had an option for date rate or for as of date and uh, total due. Now, once we have our list generated right here, you can see there's little check marks next to these clients' names. So the cool thing about the accounts receivable report is that you can mass send out an account statement to all of your clients. And an account statement sends them over basically a document that lets them know, hey, you owe um, this much at, at, at this time. And then you can even go as far as, like for example, if I click statements, email statements to selected, I can even go as far as including all unpaid supporting invoices as well.
So if maybe the client owes money on a couple different invoices, an account statement is a great way to consolidate all those invoices together and then basically send them over kind of like a little cover page that lets them know like, hey, you owe this much money at, at this time and then here are the invoices that go along and, and, and basically support that. And, and so they can see right away like exactly why they owe that much money. And if you're using one of our payment processing integrations, um, there, you can actually allow for online payment whenever you send over an account statement. Um, so your client can actually pay for the total amount that they owe online, which is pretty cool. Um, another report that's going to be um, useful for you is if you click on the reports module and go to the billing section, there's an end of day reconciliation report. And so this report is actually going to show you a summary of the total amount invoiced for today and also the total amount of payments recorded for today. It will actually break them down in, uh, by payment type as well. Um, and so here we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and generate this report. Okay, so this report actually has here, I'm gonna have to filter this by, for a different day. Okay, so I just wanna show you a little bit like actual data. Um, okay, all right, so here I filtered it for a particular day. Um, and so you can see there's, um, it will it'll tell you the total amount invoice for today and also the total amount of payments recorded for today. Uh, and it will actually break those payments down by payment types. So when you record the payment, you actually select what type of payment it is at the time. Um, and, and for example, we have our credit card payments. So a great way to use this end of day reconciliation report is to, at the end of the day, if you guys have like a POS system, um, go see the total amount of transactions that were recorded on your POS system at the end of the day. And then you can run your end of day reconciliation and you can see all of the different credit card type um, uh, credit card type payments that were recorded in Vetter. And so you can make sure that those amounts match because our POS system, that's where we, we process all of our credit card payments. So we just want to make sure that all of the transactions that were actually recorded today on our POS system, those were added in Vetter as a new payment. And if those, if those do not match, then you can obviously, there's a discrepancy and you're going to want to look into that further. And this end of day reconciliation will clue you into that. So there is a way to kind of break this down. So if there is a discrepancy with the amount of credit card payments, what I can do is I can actually go to my reports module, go to this billing section, and I can actually run the end of day detail. And so this is gonna break down the end of day reconciliation into a little bit more detail for us. So here, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna filter for that same day that we were just on. Um, so I'm gonna filter for the, uh, the, the 15th really quick. And so while this is filtering, um, uh, another thing that I want to mention is that you do have the ability to export any of the reports in Vetter as well. Um, you can either download or print the report. Um, by printing it, it generates a PDF that you can just, that will just open up on a new tab in your browser. Um, by downloading it, on the other hand, and, 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 a, and, and a PDF looks, looks, looks like this where, where you're gonna be able to just actually just print it. So it's actually the report that you can print. Um, downloading it, on the other hand, will download it as a CSV file to your device. And uh, CSV files, if you're not familiar, um, those can actually be opened up in your, in your spreadsheet software. So if you have like Microsoft Excel, for example, um, you, can, you can pull the data into Excel, and from there you can actually sort it by columns. Um, or maybe even um, um, write your own different like formulas or equations and, and, and slice and dice the data as you see fit. Um, and so those are the different options for exporting. So here's our end of day detail. And as you can see, it does give us the same summary of the total amount of payments collected, the total amount invoice. If I click payments collected, it'll take me to my payment summary. And so here are the different payment types. Um, so if I select credit card, for example, it will list out um, each invoice uh, or every single type of payment that was recorded as a credit card type payment. It'll let me know what that payment was applied to and which client that payment was in the name of. 
So if there is a discrepancy, I can kind of take a look at this credit card section. I can see which client is it listed here that I know for a fact was recorded as a transaction. Or if you're not familiar, um, what you can do is you can actually break down the amounts invoiced and you can see the different clients that were invoiced for today. And you can see if there's any client that was invoiced for today that did not have a payment recorded. And then from there, that can kind of clue you into that discrepancy as well. The last report I'm gonna share with you today, um, under the reports module, um, if you click billing, um, at the very bottom, there's a sales by provider detail, um, and then also a sales by provider summary, and also a payment by provider report as well. So you remember earlier, we were discussing how to set your staff members as a provider. Well, these reports will keep track of any kind of sales um, for all items that, that um, um, were listed under that provider or, or any payments as well. So if you do pay out production based off of, of the amount invoice for your, for, your, um, uh, for your providers or for the amount of payments recorded, um, for the services provided by your providers, these reports will help you um, um, get that information. So you can actually run these reports for your production. Um, it will start off with a summary, um, but if you scroll down, it will, it will break down each staff member into more detail as well. Um, so the summary basically will show you, um, and, and the same thing for the sales by provider report as well. Um, and you're able to filter that by any date range that you would like. Okay, so at this point, this is generally when, when I would open it up for um, a Q&A. Um, but since this is just a recorded video, um, just make sure you reach out to support if you have any questions at all. Um, we're more than happy to help you um, with anything. Um, remember to access our help desk to see our knowledge base um, or to, to submit support tickets by clicking that little blue question mark icon. And remember you can contact support by either calling 844-483-8837 or emailing support at, or emailing support, and then the email is support at vettersoftware.com. So the phone number is 844-483-8837 and the email is support at vettersoftware.com. Um, I hope you got some good information out of this training. Um, just contact us if you need help with anything at all. We're more than happy to get on the phone with you, get on a screen share with you, or just answer your phone call or answer your questions online as well. Um, so I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and thank you for taking time to learn a little bit more about better.